Great, thank you, Boris. So I'm going to tell you three stories today. The stories have to do with how species form, how species might split up. And it's work in progress. Uh, the three stories you could think of maybe as Canterbury Tales, where the pilgrims are sort of vying for, for the best story. And I guess you can decide which of the three is the best. I don't know. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank some folks. Um, who have been involved in this research. Uh, here are some of them, many of them. Uh, the research involved a lot of different aspects, growing plants, measuring things, uh, sequencing DNA, that sort of stuff. And here's a little bit of the big transfer that I do every year from and to Dalhousie to a place where the, the plants grow happily. Uh, here are some other folks who have been most intimately involved with this work. Um, Liz Wolliver, Caleb Beck, Maggie Bartkowska and Chris Kozella, who has developed all of the molecular techniques that we are using. And uh, you can see here he's useful to have because he can actually genotype without sequencing. Why do we have these things? Why are there these things we call species? Why are there these entities? Why do there seem to be relatively discrete units, at least among eukaryotes? Why don't we have these things? Why don't we have combinations of a white bull and a human, or as this artist sees, a zebra, a puma, and a beaver? Why aren't there intermediates? Why don't we have algae that, that you know, hunt the Serengeti? Why don't we have lions that photosynthesize? Why do we have these discrete things that do certain things? Well, I think ecologically, one could say that there are trade-offs, and if an organism does something well, it can't do something else as well. And there are other sorts of organisms that do those things better. So that's part of the story and that's an ecological answer. There's also an evolutionary answer and the evolutionary answer is involved with separating gene pools. And this is called reproductive isolation. And reproductive isolation involves a group of organisms, say a population that gets split into multiple populations that no longer interbreed. And species at some point become so diverged that they no longer breed. Before that, they become so diverged that their offspring do not do well. They're either inviolable or sterile. At some point, this always occurs among what we call species. How does this happen? Well, it happens early and it has to progress to a later stage. So early reproductive isolation can occur at a number of uh, points. So these include the pre-mating point, uh, post-mating point, et cetera. So this is a sort of a standard way to divide the timing of isolation. So pre-mating isolation reduces hybridization events among plants. It could involve different pollinators say, or pollinators uh, acting at different times, spatial separation of organisms, et cetera. There is a type of reproductive isolation that's gaining more interest now, and that's post-mating, but prezygotic. And so this acts after copulation or after pollination, but before embryos are formed. And this can happen in flowering plants, say, by pollen stigma incompatibilities. It can happen in the reproductive tract of uh, animals with internal fertilization. And in animals or other organisms, protists with external fertilization, uh, it can involve some sort of chemical attraction between gametes. And finally, moving along in chronologically, uh, there is post-zygotic isolation. And this is isolation that affects the fitness of offspring. So the sterility of offspring, the, in, the viability of offspring, uh, the fitness in general of hybrid offspring. The way these sorts of things evolve uh, has been modeled and looked at. And one of the first models of this was by Dobzhansky, Muller, and also by Bateman, who thought about so many things. And this is the classic Dobzhansky, Muller incompatibility. And on the left here, I've shown you a population that consists of um, individuals all at this two locus um, pair of genes having little uh, letter alleles, little a, little a, little b, little b. And as these diverge, one on the left here, evolves to have capital A's, and the one on the right evolves to have capital B's. And you'll notice that along this path, big A and big B never see each other. So at the end of the evolutionary 
trajectory here at the bottom of this horseshoe, you can see that uh, if you mate the two, then they create uh, hybrids for both, they create heterozygotes for both loci and the big A and the big B are incompatible. So this is a dobzhansky muller incompatibility. And this is a two locus model for how these sorts of things can evolve. Now it's thought that usually incompatibilities involve many, many loci, but this is the simplest sort of way. Another possibility, and this is also uh, gaining uh, much more recognition now, is something called nuclear cytoplasmic or cytonuclear incompatibility. And this has to do with the necessary crosstalk between organellar genes, that is mitochondrial genes or plastid genes and nuclear genes. Ever since these organisms were incorporated in eukaryotes, they've been trading genes back and forth, mostly from the mitochondria to the nucleus or from the plastid to the nucleus. And you can see here, we have at the top a nuclear genome that's big R, big R, and a C in red uh, organellar genome, mitochondrion or plastid. And then either drift or selection causes two different groups to evolve different plastids and different uh, nuclear genes. And by the time you get to the bottom, you have on the left, big R, big R, and a red big C. And so those have co-evolved the plastid or mitochondrion works really well with that geno nuclear genotype. And on the right, you have little r, little r, and little c. And those, if they cross, might not create combinations that work well because the nuclear genes do not interact well with the plastid or mitochondrial. So this is a possibility, especially in plants. It's um, more so perhaps in plants than uh, other organisms because there are two cytoplasmic um, organelles, both mitochondria and chloroplasts. So how does early reproductive isolation occur? Most research so far has been done among species, but the current isolating mechanisms don't necessarily have to be the ones that started it. They don't have to be the ones that were earlier. So to understand how these things get started, it would be good to look at organisms that are starting this process. And for this, I think, Geographically widespread species are especially informative because they give us an opportunity to look at separated populations. So today I'm going to tell you about cardinal flower. Cardinal flower is a widely distributed plant and I'm going to tell you three stories. The first story has to do with genetic differentiation across its range. The second story has to do with potentially parental conflict or sexual conflict and reproductive isolation. And the third story has to do with asexual seed production, also called apomixis, and reproductive isolation. And this last thing is um, really, really cool. And I think it's the first example of this in uh, flowering plants. So this is cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. It's a member of the Campanulaceae, the bellflower family. And this photograph is uh, in Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario. Um, this is my population, Ontario 01. It lives along water edges, streams, rivers, creeks, lakes, uh, across this part of North America, which you can see in the upper right of the slide. And you can see that it goes all the way essentially from New Brunswick, which is the northeasternmost part of its range. It does not get into Nova Scotia. New Brunswick, down the east side of the continent, across over into the western part in the southwest, and then down into Mexico and Central America. It is exclusively hummingbird pollinated. It is the only red flowered member of the section. The section Lobelia, section Lobelia has 25 species. They originated in North America and or Central America, somewhere in the new world. And the genus itself, Lobelia, has about 400 or so species, but 25 of them uh, are in the section Lobelia in North America. And Cardinalis is the only one that is hummingbird pollinated, the only one that is red. And here is a slow motion movie that I made of a hummingbird visiting cardinal flower. You can see its throat moving as it takes nectar from the base of the flower. Those are female phase flowers at the bottom. I'll tell you about that in a minute. 
pollen is transferred by the head of the hummingbird. It's moving up to male phase flowers. Pollen is being deposited on its head. Posing for the camera. Off it goes. So this is a fabulous genus and the section Lobelia with its 25 species in North America includes a number of really neat organisms. So this is Lobelia dortmana. Dortmana is a water Lobelia, it's aquatic and it has uh, sort of lavender to white flowers and it makes flowers both underwater and above water. And this is a really cool adaptation. It's also got leaves that can exchange gas uh, underwater, but mostly it's through the roots. So instead of the leaves taking in carbon dioxide, its roots take in the carbon dioxide. Its closest relative, cardinal flower's closest relative is thought to be Lobelia syphilitica. This is a bumblebee pollinated plant shown on the left. And you can cross the two. And when you cross them, you make this beast on the right called Lobelia bispeciosa. And you can buy seeds of this in gardening stores. And when you, this cross uh, makes these fabulous sort of magenta colored um, plants and they vary in, in color depending on the particular parents used. But they're sterile and uh, they don't, uh, you can't uh, continue to grow them, can't continue to make seeds. So cardinal flower, widespread in North America, it's a short-lived perennial. Every population that's been studied, it has been found to be diploid, so there are no polyploid pop populations. Uh, the chromosome number is 14 for diploids or seven for haploids. It has protandrous flowers. That means each flower goes through a male phase first and then a female phase. So every flower is bisexual, but it's male first and then female. And there's no overlap within a flower. So you can see on the upper left here, a male phase flower and the stamens are here. This is a stamen tube. The stamens are united into a tube. And at the top is a uh, are the five anthers united. And there are some hairs on the, on the bottom anthers. And when a hummingbird comes and pushes on those hairs, the anther tube opens up and the pollen is deposited. After some time, the female tissues push through this anther tube emerging and the stigma then opens up. So there's no self-pollination within a flower because the stigma doesn't open until it passes through the, uh, the anther tube. So, this is a female phase flower at the bottom following the male phase flower. This creates a pretty interesting issue for pollination because female flowers are older, so they tend to be at the bottom of any inflorescence and then male flowers tend to be further up. So if a hummingbird comes along and visits female phase flowers first at the bottom and moves up and moves off, that's, that's just fine. It's outcrossing the plant. It's bringing in outcross pollen and leaving with self pollen. Pollinators don't do that, they visit almost randomly. So it's a short-lived perennial. It starts out its life uh, as a seed. And you can see here the seeds um, have these, these beautiful sort of uh, net-like patterns. And this is a picture by our own Ping Li, that's a, an electron micrograph. The seeds are only about a millimeter long and half a millimeter wide, very small. And a fruit makes about a thousand seeds, somewhere between a few hundred and a thousand seeds. Seeds develop into a rosette. Here's a rosette. And the rosette then uh, will send up flowering stalks and it will flower. In the East, this happens usually in the second year. And in the West, it happens in the first year. And usually there's a single stalk sent up in the first year. After the stalks have flowered, fruiting has occurred, the stalks die back and the plant overwinters as a rosette in places where there is winter. Here's a rosette forming at the base of a plant. This happens to be from Texas. The plants in Texas are, as you would expect, gigantic. One of the interesting facts about cardinal flower, given its enormous range, is that east and west often differ in aspects of morphology. And this can also include life history. So some of the morphological characters that typically differ in the West, shown on the left here, uh, leaves are often narrower compared to in the East where they're broader. And the 
stamens tend to be shorter in the West than, than in the East. And especially, this is especially evident when you look at the part of the stamen that comes out past where the five petals have made their throat. And this little bit here sticks out less far typically in the West than it does in the East. Other sorts of differences in um, the uh, beginning of life when, uh, when a seed germinates, it might, the organism might make a rosette, it might make none, it might make one, or it might make more than one. So on the far left here is a picture of a plant from Florida that just starts to grow up. It just starts to bolt. It does not make a primary rosette. And this actually happens in plants from Florida and Panama where there is no winter. In um, most of the Eastern populations, there is a good rosette that forms and then a uh, bolting stem appears at some point. In the West, a uh, seed usually develops into several rosettes and then each of them can send up a flowering stalk. Where did this thing arise? Where did it come from? There are two major hypotheses and these are shown here. So on the left is the one from Rogers McVaugh. So this is from 1952. And he believed that the species arose somewhere in Mexico or South, and then it moved southward into Central America and also northward along two routes. So the left route here would be up along the mountain range, the Sierra Madres Occidental, and then the left would be the Sierra Madre Oriental, and then over into the Eastern part of North America and on up. Bowden, on the other hand, felt that because the rest of the section Lobelia is really centered around Alabama and Florida and that part of the world, this should be where the organism arose and its closest relative is only in Eastern North America. So, well, there are some in Western, but not down in Central America. So he thought that it, it probably started in the Southeast and then migrated to the West going down the Sierra Madre uh, Oriental and also and further into Central America and then up the Occidental. So you can see here, those are the two mountain ranges in Mexico, and they do have a, uh, a big influence on where organisms sort of migrate and where they currently live. Historically, there's been a controversy concerning the number of species that's, uh, that Lobelia cardinalis represents. It's currently considered one species with two subspecies, and this is by McVaugh, Bowden, and others. Um, others have considered it to be up to four species. This is because of phenotypic variation. A study by Thompson and Lammers in 97 looked at herbarium sheets. They studied 66 characters, 5,500 specimens, over 100 populations. They did a multivariate analysis of these traits, and they asked, can you tell geography? Can you tell populations apart? Can you tell regions apart? And they concluded, no, you cannot tell them apart. It's just a big mush. The only thing you can tell apart is if a plant has really narrow leaves, it's from the West, but not all Western plants have narrow leaves. So even if this is a single species, the pollinators are different in the East and West, and the geography should also cause differences, lack of mating. So this should promote population differentiation. And the pollinators in particular are really interesting. In the East, there's a single species. That's the ruby-throated hummingbird. The East has a single species of hummingbird, the ruby-throated hummingbird. It migrates south in the fall. It leaves this part of the world somewhere in, uh, depending on the sex, somewhere in August or so. And the plants flower in August. Um, the, uh, females and the young leave a little later up until uh, early September. So they are here until uh, they are up here when the plants are flowering and then they migrate southward. In the West, there are lots of different pollinators. Some are migratory, some are not. Lots of different species of hummingbird. There's a movie of hummingbird migration up north from the south in the springtime made by Caleb, Caleb Beck. So here we go, here, January. You can see the red dots here are ruby-throated, and the black dots here are going to be black chin. One March, 15 March, first of April,
1st of May. End of May. So this is north migra northward migration. It's the southern migration in the east, however, that's really important because that's when the uh, when cardinal flower is being pollinated. So the west and the east differ also in geography. And in the west in particular, there are regions that have so-called sky islands. And these sky islands occur in the Sierra Madre Occidental, that is the Western range. And they get up into the Southern part of Arizona and the uh, westernmost part of New Mexico. And these mountain ranges, these sky islands are separated by desert. So the plants live in, uh, at high elevations in these so-called so sky islands. And here they are. And so we have collected populations from some of these sky islands. And it also gets up into the more central region of Arizona, which is called the um, transition zone. So this is a uh, transition zone picture. So you might think of Arizona as not being the kind of place where cardinal flower lives, but there are lots of places that are cooler, lots of places that are very wet and wet year round. So this is one of them. The Sky Islands have um, dramatic scenery. There's a monsoon in this part of the world in uh, uh, July and August. And so here's a monsoon looking from the Huachuca Mountains over the San Rafael Valley. The pollinators in the West include things like the broad-billed hummingbird, broad-tailed hummingbird, rufous. There are other visitors that vary in number from year to year, and they are certain, almost certainly not pollinators. They're just nectar thieves. Here's one. There's a couple of different species of swallowtail. And here's a day-flying sphingid, Hylis lineata which in some years is really common and other years completely absent. So what about genetic differentiation? I would say that pollinators in geography would predict that East and West are different because there are different pollinators and different geography. And because of geography, that there should be higher differentiation within Western than within Eastern populations. We can test this in a number of ways. Um, a standard way is to use a statistic called FST, which was developed by Sewell Wright at the University of Chicago. And then this was modified by Masatoshi Nei and then by Hedrick in various ways that uh, I won't really talk about here. Uh, and then one can also cluster uh, populations by asking about how many ancestral populations are contributing to the current um, set of uh, individuals and populations. You can also do a principal component analysis or study genome size. So we've done all these sorts of things. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this here. FST is a way of differentiating populations and asking how different they are compared to the population as a whole or all the subpopulations. So we uh, have developed, well, Chris Cozella has developed several genetic markers and these include both uh, simple sequence repeats or microsatellites and uh, SNPs. And so currently we have working about 25 simple sequence repeats. 24 of these are nuclear and we have a plastid one as well. And the, these microsatellites are repeated segments of some motif. So it's the number of segments that essentially is the allele. The advantages are uh, they're not expressed for one that can be an advantage because they are more or less neutral, at least putatively. They have high mutation rates, so they're highly variable. And per locus, they're far more informative than SNPs. SNPs, on the other hand, are, tend to be easier to um, develop, and uh, they can be developed in the thousands or, or tens of thousands. Um, we have 97 here right now, 58 nuclear, 20 plastid, and 19 mitochondrial. And single nucleotide polymorphisms are just what they say. They are single nucleotides that differ among individuals. So. We um, look at these by uh, sequencing and uh, the sequencing gives us a large number of reads. This is really helpful in, um, uh, for sing uh, simple sequence repeats in particular. Uh, they are individually barcoded and um, they, we can run the microsatellites through uh, Megasat software developed here at Dalhousie. Um, but also we have discovered that there are uh, SNPs within the SSR, so we wrote our own code to uh, help help with that. So here's our sampling. 
we have 12 Western populations and 28 Eastern populations represented here. And that goes from Panama at the bottom, Mexico into the West, and then all the way up into New Brunswick, the easternmost part of the range of the species. What did we find? Do East and West differ? Morphology says no. Yes, East and West differ dramatically. If we ask for what's called a K, a cluster number of two in uh, this program called Instruct, we use Instruct because it's, it's more appropriate for plants than a commonly used program called Structure. Instruct allows inbreeding and, and some other things. So here are, here's plastid information. The plastids show that the West and the East are well differentiated. You might notice here that you, so West is in blue. You might notice that Alabama, four Alabama populations and our one Florida population pick up some of the West as, and Panama is shown right here. So this is a raid West to East. That's why you see Panama off in the middle because we have a strict West to East layout here. So that's neat. What about mitochondrial? Well, Mitochondrial genes show something similar. However, there isn't a clear differentiation between West and East. Instead, we have all West, which is pretty similar. And then we have Alabama and Florida, which are Western-like. We have Virginia, Western-like. Panama, uh, Maryland, which is Western-like. Panama, of course. And then New Brunswick, a complete surprise. So there seems to be some mixing here. Remember that these plastids and mitochondrial, plastid and mitochondrial genes are transferred by seed or by whole plants that move and not by pollen. If we combine the two, then we get just what you would expect. We get a mixture of the two bits of information. Okay, so let's uh, look at SSR. So here's our mitochondrial and plastid uh, diagram, cluster diagram at the top. And if we look at nuclear, um, my, microsatellites, then we have a very clear picture. You can say that the differentiation with microsatellites is stronger than it is with the organeller genes. So that's for K equals two. If we move up to K equals three and say, well, maybe there were three original populations, then we clearly differentiate among the nuclear genes at the bottom. We clearly differentiate Arizona from Mexico, Texas, and Colorado, and then from all of the East. So one can just keep looking at these and looking at these, and uh, that's a lot of fun, but uh, it's uh, sort of uh, tough to get a lot of uh, clear information sometimes when you just keep increasing the number of groups. But if we do this and we look in just the East and increase the number of groups to say seven, then we find that uh, they fall out in a particular way. And in this in this case, uh, Florida separates from Alabama. Uh, the Midwest is largely similar. This is Ohio and Michigan and Indiana, Indiana, et cetera. And New Brunswick is different. This is nuclear genes. So New Brunswick is coming out as different in both mitochondrial and nuclear in some cases. So if we look at the Western, the nuclear information is really cool. It shows that the Sierra Madre Occidental, that's the Arizona populations, is different from the Eastern Sierra Madres. That's uh, basically Colorado, Texas, and Mexico, that area. So that's, uh, that's really cool. And we can keep playing around with these things. To summarize, the average differentiation is lowest in the East, just as we predicted. So if we look at FST, the average is 0.16. Within the West, it's 0.34. And between the two regions, between East and West, it's 0.47. So all of these predictions, uh, all of these uh, findings are what we predicted. We find, also found that nuclear um, markers are more differentiated than organella markers. We can also ask, how does differentiation as measure, measured by FST, or it's the same with GST or G'ST, how does this change with geographic distance? And here you can see that as you would expect, there's an increase in population differentiation with geographic distance. And so in red here is shown within the east, and in blue is within the west. 
and the black is east versus west. And I think you can see here that the blue has a higher sort of gain, a higher slope, if you will, of differentiation with distance compared to the east. It's not really valid to draw lines through these points because the points uh, share populations. Each point is a pair of populations. If we do a uh, PCA on this, um, it, the first axis on nuclear SSRs, the first axis clearly differentiates the east and the west, and the second axis differentiates these populations, the two of the Texas populations in Colorado from the others in the west. Of course, there are, there are clustering techniques and then there are trees. And so one wants to know sort of the order of evolution. And uh, so far, all I'm going to present today is uh, this simple UPGMA tree. So this uses um, Nay's uh, genetic distance. And you can see here that the clustering, so this is just clustering. This is, of course, it's a rooted tree being UPGMA, but it's, um, um, one doesn't know how to, you know, it's not properly rooted with, a, with an outgroup. Panama is the most distant from everybody else. The Midwest groups together, New Brunswick groups together, coming off of the Midwest, Alabama, Florida, and Virginia group together, and then all the West groups together. So big consistency here. Genetics and morphology tell different stories. Okay, that's story one. What's considered to be one species is clearly genetically differentiated in the East and the West. The second story I want to tell you has to do with what's known as parental conflict. It might also have to do with cytonuclear interactions. Imagine that you are a parent and you are co-sexual. That is to say, you make both male and female gametes. And that's true of most flowering plants. If you are such an organism and you are thinking of reproduction from the female point of view, then you are related by half to all of your offspring. So the dam, that's the mother, is related by half to all of her offspring, no matter what the sire is. Sire one, if there are multiple sires, is related by half to each of his offspring. Sire two is related by half to each of his offspring. However, sire one is related to sire two's offspring far less than a half. What this means is that there is selection, there should be selection for sire one to garner more resources for his own offspring and sire two to garner more resources for his own offspring. In other words, if an allele can figure out that it's in sperm and not egg, then it should say, okay, I'm going to garner resources. I'm going to get as much as I can for my embryo. And those sorts of alleles should evolve. So the mother, on the other hand, should evolve a way to fight that as sort of a tug of war or some recognition system. And she, she wants all of her, in a sense, wants all of her offspring to be the same size. So there should be this conflict where the alleles pull up in seed size for the father and pull down in seed size for the mother. And this is parental conflict or sexual conflict. There are opposing interests in maternal associated and, patern and maternally associated alleles. How could this happen, you might say? An allele ha occurs in both fathers and mothers. How can this happen? It can happen by genomic imprinting where an allele is expressed or not expressed depending on whether it's in the sperm or the egg. So this is an example of parent-specific gene expression and genes are turned on or off depending on the gamete. This imprinting in flowering plants occurs, interestingly, mostly in the endosperm and not in the embryo. And the endosperm, you might remember, is that tissue that feeds the offspring. The endosperm has two parts maternal and one part paternal. That is two maternal haploid genomes and one paternal haploid genome. And there is this concept called endosperm balance number where the mating entities need to have their, their endosperm balance number the same so that this two to one ratio works out. Uh, typically the ma maternal tissues are the central cell that becomes the endosperm are demethylated and the paternal are not. So as pointed out by Brand, Bain, and Haig in, in uh, 2005, since parental conflicts can perturb fertilization and development, 
These conflicts may strengthen reproductive barriers between populations contributing to speciation. So we would expect populations to have some differences in seed size, that's fine. We would also expect them to have differences in pulling strength. These don't need to be related. They can be separate things, big seeds, little seeds, strong pulling, weak pulling. But we would expect populations to be at some sort of equilibrium, each one, for pulling strength, male and female pulling strength, male pulling up, female pulling down. We would expect in particular that outcrossing populations should show this most strongly and selfing populations should show it weakly or not at all. And for us though, we would expect resolutions would differ among populations. That is provisioning strengths should uh, be similar in closely related populations, but potentially quite different in unrelated populations. To test this, you can do reciprocal crosses. And um, I've now done uh, thousands of these. And uh, what you do is you take pollen from uh, one plant and you apply it to the stigma of another, another plant. And it's quite easily done in cardinal flower because they have these large flowers with separate male and female phases. So no need to do emasculations worry, and worry about that. And then uh, you can tag them with these uh, shark skin tags, so-called. You can do this uh, in a greenhouse. You can do it outdoors if you have the proper netting. This is a uh, hummingbird torture area where hummingbirds fly by and look at the banquet underneath and can't get to it. And then uh, after we do crosses, we measure the seeds. So currently we have 19 populations with seeds measured, crosses made and seeds measured, eight west, 11 east. We've done all the within, all the pairwise and all the reciprocal when possible. Uh, seed size is determined by scanning because these are very small seeds and we quantify the area. And um, so far we've done this for about 23,000 seeds. So these are the populations crossed. We have eight west and 11 east in this case and we have many more descendant generations. So the question is, when you cross these populations, is there an abnormally large or abnormally small seed made? And you can show here that this is a proportional change. So if the hybrid seed is smaller than the normal within population cross, then there is a reduction, a proportional reduction shown on the left. If the hybrid is larger, then there is a, an inc a proportional increase shown on the right. So these reciprocal crosses, when you compare the size to a normal cross, will reveal this sort of, uh, this sort of issue. So what does this mean? Well, it, abnormal crossing, abnormal sizes can come from a number of causes. So this could include heterosis. So that is populations that actually have um, a benefit by crossing with a different population, maybe both cr crossing directions will increase in seed size. There could be outbreeding depression of a general sort, a nuclear outbreeding depression, so that both crosses result in a decrease. And it could be the case, as we just talked about, that sexual conflict differs. There's a difference in pulling strength. And in that case, you would find that one direction results in a proportional decrease in seed size compared to normal and the other direction is an increase. So what did we find? We found that east and west seed size doesn't differ. That's fine, that's great, fabulous. Here are proportional changes in hybrid seed size for a subset of our data. I've circled the cases where we have an up-down pattern. Arizona 2 by Indiana, for example. In one direction, there's an increase in seed size, in the other direction, a decrease. It so happens that, so the Western mom is shown in brown or orange, and the Eastern mom is shown in blue. So what this means is that when the Western mom, when the Western plant is the mom and Eastern is the dad, there's an increase. When the opposite is true, when the Eastern is the mom and the Western is the dad, there's a decrease. What this means is that the Eastern population pulls harder when it's female downward and pulls harder when it's male upward. In other words, East pulls harder than West in every single example here. So we have this 
difference in seed size depending on crossing direction. If east is the father, then the seed size is abnormally large when crossed to the west. If west is the father, then the seed size is abnormally small when crossed to the east because the west is weak. And this happens over and over and over. So we see this pattern. So there's also um, evidence for this sort of thing uh, within regions. So on the left, I've shown some west by west crosses. And you can see here, Panama and Arizona 6, for example, both directions result in an increase. That's interesting in seed size. However, if you mate Arizona 6 by Arizona 2, and they're not very far apart, they're both in the transition zone around um, Sedona, these have show this conflict. They show an increase in one crossing direction and a decrease in the other. And within the east, the same sort of pattern, sometimes both down, sometimes uh, one up, one down, and occasionally both sort of up. So a variety of sorts of results here. If you take the average difference here, you take this average difference. So whether they're up or down, take the absolute value and take the average, take the average proportional uh, you know, offset from the hybrid seed or the crossing seed and graph it against geographical distance. And let's say you have to go through Florida. In other words, not just straight geodesic distance, but going through Florida. Then you find this very strong relationship between geographic distance and the proportional change, the average absolute value of the proportional change. And you can see here, it's true of the East, it's true of the West, and it's true of East by West. And that's a really, really, really cool finding. So overall pattern, the absolute value on average within the East changes by about 12%, within the West by about 16%, and between East and West by about 24%. We can also ask about the patterns. Are there up-down patterns consistent with this parental conflict? Yes, there are. Between regions, there are 14. Within regions, there are nine. There are also, however, an equal sort of uh, set, eight and 13, where both go down. So there seems to be a number of different things going on here, where there's evidence for both parental conflict and just a general decrease in uh, seed size in crossing between distant generations, di di distant populations. So we'd also like to know, of course, whether seed size affects anything else like germination. So we've done this sort of thing and this is ongoing um, work that we're continuing right at this moment. Let me just move along here to the next talk topic. So story number three on your way to Canterbury. We have discovered that every time you cross any pair of populations, no matter where from, the organism makes seeds. Panama, New Brunswick, Texas, Florida, it doesn't matter. It always makes seeds. We also noticed that sometimes when these crosses are made, the offspring look exactly like the mother population, the maternal population. And so at first we thought, well, there must be some sort of cytoplasmic genes controlling this, et cetera. Is that what went on? Well, it turns out something much stranger is going on. So you'll recall that in flowering plants, there is a double fertilization event so that one sperm fertilizes the egg to make the embryo and the other sperm fertilizes the central cell to make the triploid endosperm. And here's the endosperm and here's the embryo. So, we then thought, well, what about the possibility that we have asexual seed production going on? This is called apomixis. And so we looked at this um, by genotyping the offspring. And in fact, to our complete surprise, this is what's happening. Here is a cross between Ontario 1, Algonquin, and Florida 1, Tallahassee. And they make sexual offspring. Great, just as you would expect, two Eastern populations. Here's a cross between Panama and Florida. No matter which direction you cross them, every offspring produced is produced asexually. It's a clone of mom. Here's Arizona two by Ontario one, both directions. Every 
seed, every offspring is a clone of mom. Here's Arizona 6 and Florida. This is really interesting. Here we have Florida by Arizona 6, so Florida being the mom, crossed with an Arizona dad. They're all asexual, all apomictic. The reverse cross, half of the offspring are apomictic and half are sexual, half are true hybrids. So that's Florida dad, Arizona mom. Similarly with Arizona and Panama within the West. One direction is all sexual in this case, and the other direction is partly sexual and partly apomictic. Same with Panama and Ontario. And this is really interesting because they're very far apart. In one direction, they're all apomictic, and in the other direction, they make a mixture of apomictic and sexual hybrids. So this just, just uh, blew our socks off. And um, you wonder, uh, how does this happen? Well, it uh, must involve endosperm. And that's because, that, because pollination is required. These plants don't make seeds unless they are pollinated. The plants don't spontaneously make asexual seeds as some flowering plant species do. They need to be pollinated. So if there's a role for endosperm, and here's a uh, confocal micrograph of uh, endosperm in a developing um, cardinal flower ovule. If this endosperm is somehow involved, is it perhaps fertilized so it develops? And then some diploid cell nearby takes over and says, either I grow better than the embryo or the embryo dies and becomes the, the new uh, sporophyte, is the clone of the mother. Is that what's happening? Well, you can ask that question by genotyping the seeds because the seeds have both endosperm and embryo and the maternal seed coat in them. So if there is paternal tissue in the seed, then it would be in the endosperm and that would be evidence that this sort of thing could be happening. So we did that and here's what we found. So in the top is a cross between Arizona and Ontario. And if we cross Arizona, the mother is shown on the left here, the dam. By Ontario, we, these are apomictic. We find that the number of reeds in the sporophyte, that is the offspring generation from the father, the number of sire reeds is zero because it's a clone. However, in the seed, the fraction of all reads, sequencing reads for, this is a, one, one locus, for example, is 0.17, 17%. Similarly, in the other direction, this is an apomictic cross, no sexual offspring produced. However, 7% of the reads from the seed are from dad. Similarly, we have Florida by Arizona 6 in the fourth row, apomictic, 11% of the reads are from dad compared to none in, the, in the, genera uh, the next generation. This, however, is a mixed cross. So we have Arizona 6 by Florida. And when you mate them in that direction, the offspring are mixed. So they're either, each offspring either has 0% dad or half dad, but the seeds grouped together have 19% sire DNA. So this, and then we have uh, in Indiana and Arizona too, the same story. So what this clearly shows is that even though the offspring are often asexual or ap apomictically produced, there is a component that is uh, from the sire in the seeds, and that is no doubt the endosperm. So of course we want to put all this together and ask about reproductive isolation, how much comes from apomixis, how much comes from something like parental conflict or cytonuclear problems. And let me skip that. What we found is that with, uh, oh, on the left here, <laughs> this is uh, apomixis here on the left, it's not labeled, it's apomixis. We found that at, with some genetic distance, there is extensive apomixis. Apomixis is, of course, complete reproductive isolation when it occurs in both directions. When it occurs in one direction, it's partial. When it occurs in only some part of the seeds, it's partial. So that part is uh, very strong between East and West. We also want to know how 
genetic distance and geographic distance determine reproductive isolation arising through seed size differences and then the consequences of seed size differences. That is to say, um, fitness differences. So in germination, in early survival, et cetera. So those are the sorts of things we're working on now. So I've told you three different stories. Cardinal flower is uh, historically, controversially, controversially been to put into one species, two species, or four species. We have genetic evidence that goes against the morphological evidence that this is two groups of, uh, 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 there are two groups in cardinal flower. We found that reproductive isolation is nearly complete between west and east for many of the populations. We found that uh, this reproductive isolation, therefore, uh, can be ordered in order of decreasing importance. So uh, the most important is apomixis, the failure of hybrid seeds to be produced, and then hybrid fitness, and then perhaps parental provisioning conflict. For all of this, hummingbirds set the stage. The different populations, the different species of hummingbirds, where they migrate, where they live, and when they live there have set the stage for this differentiation of populations. What's interesting about this system is that all of this is occurring within what is currently considered to be a single species. So this is early reproductive act isolation acting within a single species. Thanks very much. <laughs>